Well, as mayor of Dubuque and on behalf of my city council colleagues, the city of Dubuque staff, our presenting sponsor, Crescent Electric Supply Company, and the residents of Dubuque, it is truly my honor to welcome you to the Growing Sustainable Communities Conference this year. I'm proud of the ways this conference has grown each year and glad of its return after a two-year break, as I know many of you are as well. It's grown in scope, expertise, and technology. And speaking of technology, don't forget to download the app for the conference, the Whova app, right? Whova, yes. So make sure you download that. It has everything you need to know about the conference. And I want to welcome those traveling to Dubuque. I know that it's grown a little bit more challenging. We're working very hard to get those flights straight back in here, so we won't stop working on that, hopefully by the next time you have a conference here. But thank you, despite those travel challenges. And to the locals who stay committed to moving climate action forward in our town, welcome to you too. Today, we need the need for local action is more important than ever. As we face the climate crisis in our communities, we know that no one policy is right-sized to protect communities across the country. We must act locally to create strategies that will address the global effects of climate change and prepare for it as well. Businesses, universities, local governments, and organizations are stepping up to the challenge. We've seen the federal government pass legislation to support our efforts after long last. And we experience interconnectedness. Climate action is equity work. Complete streets reduce GHG emissions and improve health and air quality while creating safe routes to school. These are holistic approaches to many issues that face our society today. We rely on one another to create resilient, sustainable cities and communities, making commitments to doing our part, to work with our partners to create more inclusive, welcoming, and equitable communities for all our residents. Human-centered, being in a relationship with each other, and addressing systemic and institutional inequalities have existed in our in our communities for that have, I'm sorry that have existed in our communities for many years. You know, here in Dubuque, we do continue to prioritize sustainability, and equity is a centerpiece in all of our effort, all of our efforts. I would like to thank city staff once again, the Travel Dubuque staff, the Grand River Center staff, and our conference sponsor, Crescent Electric Supply Company, for making this event possible. And while we're at it, since we have an opportunity right now, let's go ahead and thank the Grand River Center staff for this wonderful lunch and everything that they're doing for us today. And before we proceed, I also want to thank our additional sponsors. So we have a platinum sponsor, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, gold sponsor and reception sponsor, Blue Path Finance, Bronze sponsors ISG, AARP Iowa, Black Hills Energy, Shive Hattery, and Alliant Energy. And all our additional sponsors and exhibitors and the great session speakers, because without, without all of these folks, these, this conference would not be possible. So thank you very much for all your efforts and all your support. I encourage all conference attendees to spend some time in the exhibit hall during your breaks, uh, just right outside these doors here, and exploring the products and services of these businesses and our sponsors and exhibitors. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you our first extraordinary keynote speaker, Noah Wilson-Rich. Dr. Noah Wilson-Rich, PhD, is an author and an urban ecologist on a mission to improve pollinator health worldwide as a means to support our global food system and transform our urban areas from gray to green. He is a co-founder and CEO at The Best Bees Company, the nation's largest beekeeping service that installs and maintains honey beehives for corporate rooftops and grounds nationwide, as well as beekeeper to the stars, including Whoopi Goldberg and partnerships with MIT, Harvard, TED, National Geographic, and NASA. He's inspired by community gardens and underutilized spaces in cities around the world. Using a custom-built digital platform to collect bee health data at scale, the Best Bees Company makes an outsized impact on the larger mission to save the bees and helps clients understand that quantifiable impact they have on the environment by opening their rooftops to pollinators. Noah pioneered a standardized data-centric approach to beekeeping that has yielded new insights into not just what's killing pollinators, but what makes them thrive. His perspective, as both a leading scientist in his field and the CEO of a growing LGBTQ business, inspires audiences to understand the fierce urgency of now and how they can take action to build a sustainable future. Noah is a thought-provoking and candid industry expert, championing, 
championing technology and innovation to solve some of the grand challenges of our time. He's been featured in the New York Times, National Geographic, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, Fox News, Fortune, and Business Insider, and his three TEDx talks have over two million views. So it's my pleasure to in invite Mr. Noah, or Dr. Noah Wilson-Rich to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I've been looking forward to this for so long. I'm sure that some of you are feeling the similar energy. It's been years since we've been together. It's incredible to finally be here. This is my first time in Dubuque. So Mayor Kavanaugh, Gina Bell, City Council, to each of you, thank you for welcoming me. Thank you for helping to lead this conversation. I'm sure that some of you at times have felt like maybe it's just one of you having these sustainability conversations and talking to others about it when people are like, yeah, but what about all these other issues? There are so many issues in the world today. And when we flip through the news, when we turn on the news here in Iowa <laughs> these days, and we see 50 political ads in five seconds, it can feel really overwhelming. And this is just here in our own local community. So this is happening everywhere. And it can feel so difficult to make any sort of change, especially when what we're doing is actually quite timeless. It's so important, and so what I've been able to determine over time is that people really do want to make a difference, and to be able to harness the power of everybody who wants to do better, even if they're limited in their ability, but to take a lesson from beehives and to understand that these are social systems that have been around for way longer than we have. Honeybees have been around for 100 million years, and as social creatures, we have a lot to learn from them. Like, how do we empower our neighbors to do more, to go beyond the headlines, to maybe turn the TV off for a second, and to say, let's do this together. Let's band up, and let's form a society that works, and let's advance using, God forbid, the word science here, so that we can have information, and then we can have discussions as a community about what we want to do with it, and how we want to interpret it, and figure out if it's relevant. How do we do good together? That's the main question that drove my research when I started working with bees back in 2005, before bees started vanishing. If any of you heard about the vanishing of the bees, this was something that was really getting headlines because it wasn't just a dead bee story as we hear these days, but back in 2006, colony collapse disorder, or CCD, started in the United States where bees were vanishing, no dead bodies. And for any of you who do like watching TV, the CSI TV shows were also picking up steam around that time, and everybody loved a good missing body story. Like, oh, what happened? How do you know who killed it if you don't know where the body is? Let's do forensics. So people started to get interested in these types of stories, and that overlapped with the interest in my work, which at the time was just looking at the lessons we could learn from non-human successful societies about how we can be better communities. So I started in 2005. Bees started disappearing later that first year. And people would say, hey, you work with bees. What's going on? What can we learn? What can we do? And I said, whoa, I've been in the library all year. If there are any of you who went to grad school, it is just, you don't even know if it's light or dark out sometimes. You're just reading all the time. And so it made me realize that what we were doing, what I was working on was so much more relevant. Now, today we're gonna cover a few items here. I mean, we're gonna talk about why bees matter. Anybody who eats food needs bees. That's the most simple way that I can put it. And even if you're somebody like my dad, who doesn't eat fruits and vegetables and doesn't care about healthy things, I say, okay, well, what about cattle? You like steak, dad? What about dairy? The hay and alfalfa that go into feeding our cattle come from pollination. He's like, oh, okay, all right, whatever. <laughs> So kind of made a little progress there, and as we all know, you can't change the world every day, but Lord knows we can try, and the way to do it is having conversations. So anybody who eats food needs bees. We are learning so much about bees relating to our best human selves, and especially when we take a grassroots approach, something that we call citizen science. 
something that allows and empowers everyday people to participate in the conversations in meaningful ways, meaning how do we collect data? Now, citizen science is not a new term, and there are some amazing free websites out there that you should hopefully know about, and if you don't, maybe you're taking notes now. One is called iNaturalist, and iNaturalist is kind of almost a social media approach for if you're taking a walk with your family and you see a bug or a plant or anything in nature, you can have this app, you take a picture, upload it, and it geotags where you are so that experts can say, oh, that's this species. Or, wow, you just found an endangered species and you're helping us to track where it is. Or if you have students or kids at home and you can just say, well, what's that? And they might say, oh, yeah, that's a honeybee. It helps you identify where you are and it helps people to start recording data about biodiversity in our own communities and it connects communities for free. So not only are we starting to talk to one another here in Dubuque, but we'll compare, oh, do you have this in Cedar Rapids? Is this in Chicago? Is this in Canada? It really helps put all communities on the map in a free way that empowers people to start increasing the knowledge collectively of what we can understand is already here. I call this backyard biology. And as a kid for myself, for any of you remembering in lockdown when we would stare out our windows, we would just think, what is out there? And if any of you can remember when you were a kid, grass was so fascinating back then. We'd think, what's down there? Remember Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? Like an 80s or 90s movie? You can see that the world through a child's eyes is endlessly filled with wonder. As adults, we're busy. We have to commute to work. We have to worry about paying the bills. You know, and, you know how do I talk to my family about politics? We don't look down. We don't notice things as much. But when we do, we start to feel better. And that's a concept that's being used in architecture these days called biophilia. Biophilia is how when we relate things to nature, we feel better. And so architecture, if we think about that as a planned, built environment, is starting to include aspects of biophilia. And now for tenants and residents of these green buildings, we're starting to be able to advance conversations that include other citizen science projects. One is called a bio blitz. That's something that communities are doing all around. Sometimes it's a bee blitz, sometimes it's a beetle blitz. But you come around as a certain date and time and community and volunteers, and you just find as many different species as you can. And if you do that in the same day of the year, maybe same time of the year, over time you start to build records as citizen scientists coming together and saying, okay, June 5th, 2022, at noon, between noon and four, we saw you know, 80 species of different things. Maybe iNaturalist can help you identify that. And over time, you start to build records as a community in ways that it really includes any age or ability or background um, coming together for these blitzes. Another really fun citizen science project, again, that I'm not detailing too much today, but to build on this, it's called the Great Sunflower Project. And this is one of my favorites, especially here in the heartland. Sunflowers are everywhere. I love them. They're so big and bright and cheerful. The Great Sunflower Project involves really a folding chair, a pen, and a pad of paper. And you come out at the same time of day, and you just watch the sunflower, and you record how many different creatures visited it. I mean, it's relaxing, and it advances our understanding of what's already in our community because you then report that information onto the greatsunflower.org website in a way that helps us track and measure biodiversity and understand what's in our communities, what has been lost over time in our communities. I mean, how many of you remember as a road trip and when you were a kid, how many insects were splattered on your windshield? That's kind of gross for having lunch. But these days, kids don't experience that anymore like we did. You know, and did we measure that at the time? Did we say like, oh, these species were on our windshield? I mean, we really didn't pay attention to this as a movement when we were younger, but these opportunities are out there now and they're free. And all they require is a shift in perspective for how to build communities through science while making a measurable impact on the sustainability of our communities as it relates to biodiversity. So I'm packing a lot in here. But today we're gonna to talk mostly about honeybees. And honeybees are so fascinating for many reasons, but as a scientist myself, I really love to learn from the bees and to think, what are the bees telling us? Honeybees are not native to the Americas. They're an indicator species, meaning they're telling us how the environment is doing, but are we listening to them? Are we paying attention to the information that they're giving us? 
Humans have been working with honeybees for thousands of years. We see over 9,000 years ago with some cave-dwelling drawings in Spain that we were harvesting honey from wild beehives. And honeybees started to be domesticated for agricultural pollination purposes in Egypt, floating beehives down the Nile River as agriculture was starting to develop along the Nile. And so that was kind of a migratory beekeeping operation thousands of years ago, about 9,000 years ago. That means we have thousands of years of history with understanding honeybees, with knowing their health. Honeybees are worldwide as our beekeepers. And so this approach to science and understanding how nature is doing is universal. And that means we here in Dubuque can talk to Dubai and understand how are your bees doing? How have they changed over time? And it standardizes our research approach so that when we look at things like we'll talk about today with honey and understand the plant DNA in honey, we can have a controlled research approach to know that whatever's being found around the world is standard. So we're gonna get into that a little bit today. We're gonna talk about my favorite called the gray to green movement for cities. When you look over city rooftops and there's nothing there, that's exhausting to me, that angers me because there was habitat before we created this built environment and we're just leaving nothing in its place. When we know that it makes us feel better to see a green rooftop and it's an amenity so that buildings that are green have more value, they get more credit, they get more marketing benefit, people wanna live and work in green buildings and um, it's something that I find a lot of excitement for because this is something that only requires a shift in perspective and when we start to talk about real estate companies and green buildings, they can lower their operating costs, lower insulation costs. So there's a lot to talk about and to unpack today. So I'm gonna cover a few of these things um, in a way that I think really relates to all pollinators. Now, as I mentioned, honeybees are but one of 200,000 species of pollinators worldwide, hard at work every day. Now, of the 200,000 species, there are moths and beetles and butterflies and hummingbirds. 10% of those are bees, so there are about 20,000 species of bees worldwide. Here in Dubuque, we've got over 300 different species of bees right under our noses. I could name five, and I have a PhD in this. So I call these other species here, I call them cryptic, meaning they're hidden, they're kind of hiding from us, maybe for good reason, but there's so much more to be discovered if only we looked right under our noses in our own backyards and maybe took a kid's eye view to see what's there. Everything has a biological role for some reason, even if we don't understand it. You know, nature doesn't require our understanding. But when we lose a species, we lose its function. And that's a really devastating impact to things like agriculture here. A lot of growers don't understand pollinator match with what they're growing. And so it's really important to have these conversations and to engage everybody at the table, whether they're big ag or just a backyard beekeeper, um, because we can do a lot more work together by having these conversations. We are learning a lot about how to coexist in nature. We think about the food that we eat. We think about often one out of every three bites of food comes from bees, over 100 fruits and vegetables. And when we think about the other species of bees across North America, there's 4,000 native species of bees. We think about how little we see them and what information we can get from honeybees that could be applied to native bees. Now, um, one chapter of my book, chapter six, is called The Bee Directory, and that's something that at River Lights Bookstore, I'll head there later, you can take a look and flip through it, and it's almost a field guide to these other bees that are in our community that we don't know anything about. And so if we know that honeybees are dying at about 45% of colonies each year in America, that's a really big problem. 40, about one out of two beehives dies every year. Now beekeepers can help those populations bounce back through what's called splitting. So most beekeepers will have two beehives or more so that when one dies, they can repopulate the dead ones by moving bees over. Maybe from one living beehive, they'll go to two, three, or more. But there are no beekeepers for these other species that we don't understand. And so those populations are likely declining at similar rates to as honeybees are from diseases and pesticides um, and habitat loss, not enough plant biodiversity to support them. So there's not much that right now we can do for other native species other than talk about them and to understand what we do know from honeybees that could be applied to make an assumption for other species. So 
a lot to dig into. Now, when we start with the wonderful world of bees, I like to share how bees see the world because this conversation is about shifting our perspective. And when I've given TEDx talks on the stage there, we always think about how do we make an impact without having to spend more money while we're building community? How do we inspire and educate people? So the way that a bee sees the world is very different from us. They cannot see red, but they do see ultraviolet. And when you think about flowers, maybe in your own garden or farm or just in the community, think about how we see it, but try to put on some glasses to shift the light spectrum to more blue and purple. And if you want to build a bee garden or bee habitat, think about blue and purple and even white flowers to attract the bees. It can bring in some art and landscape design. And then for hummingbirds, what color do you hummingbirds like? Red. So some red and hot colors for hummingbirds, cool colors in the garden for bees. You can start to do more when you shift your perspective here, and you can play around with color and beautify your neighborhood. Now, in terms of multitasking, honeybees are generalists. For my book, I could not find a species of bee that only went to one plant. I found some amazing stories, like squash bees exist here. They actually take naps inside squash flowers during high noon when the flowers close, and then when the, the high noon sun has passed, the flowers will open back up, and those cute cuddling bees will then fly on. This is right in our own backyards. I mean, if we only noticed, we would think like, wow, that's kind of cute for a bug, you know? <laughs> it makes our lives better, and it's really important to think about the other species that exist here, because that's a big shift in the national conversation. Back in 2005, the conversation was, ew, why bees? <laughs> And I think, oh, we can learn a lot from their societies. You know, how do they stay healthy? They don't have doctors and hospitals and nurses and pharmacies, and yet they stay healthy for millions of years. How can we do that too? It shifted then to, wait, why are bees dying? To, why do we care about bees? Wait, where does my food come from? My food doesn't come from the grocery store? <laughs> okay, good. That conversation was around 2010, right? Progressing, okay. And then you started to see people in cities think, oh, Wait, farm to table, I like that. I wanna know where this food comes from. Who is the farmer? And then you would hear rooftop to table movements with urban agriculture. We start seeing conference centers around the country have rooftop beehives, have rooftop gardens, because that helps to draw in business from discerning clients and think, oh, that's a hyper-local food system. And now the conversation is, oh, well, what species of bee like, yeah, right on, this is great, okay. And that's where we are now in 2022 for the conversation. People wanna know, oh, is that a native species? Yeah, awesome, good, 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 keep asking these questions. This is great. How do we know what's native? How do we know what's not? Well, let's go for a walk. We can do what I love to call as a pollinator safari. And you can just, you know, take a picture. You don't have to know what it is, but the fact that people are aware means that our decisions are going to be better. We're not just gonna bulldoze and leave nothing left there. We're not just gonna spray chemicals because nobody wants to see nature. We might think, oh, maybe a meadow is just as pretty. You know, we can, as a community, make our own decisions, and I think that's part of what makes America really work. So this is an image of some of the different types of bees out there. The bottom left is a, a blown up green sweat bee. They are green in color, metallic looking, really neat creatures. Now, some of these, might make you feel itchy or gross or I don't like bugs and I get it, but bees are vegan. What makes bees unique is that they feed entirely on flowers, so they're going to flowers and coming home, and that's it. So when we think about pollinator habitat, we think about two things, foraging, so that's the flowers, and nesting, where do they live? And that's the two, the, uh, the most important component there. They are not wasps, they are not hornets, they are not yellow jackets. Those are the cousins of bees, and they are the meat eaters. And I like to think about Jurassic Park when you see those scenes of the kids petting the vegan, the vegetarian dinosaurs and running from the meat eaters. That's kind of like bees and wasps. And beekeepers don't want to get hurt either. And uh, you know, I own a company that does beekeeping. We install and manage honey beehives um, for uh, 22 different communities in the United States. And we create jobs, paying jobs for beekeepers, especially for folks over age 50 who might be looking for work to get income in a different way, maybe to complement their honey sales or their migratory beekeeping or whatever already exists. I was thinking about how do I start a business that's 
different. When I was finishing up my PhD around 2009, the economy was terrible, kind of today. We were thinking, wow, there are, the grants are harder and harder to come by. The tenure track faculty jobs, that was what we were expected to do in my class, that, those were more competitive than ever, and everybody went to the unemployment line. And I started thinking, what have I done with my life? I should have gone to business school. I should have done something else. And instead, I started a Facebook page. And I was bartending at the time. I was teaching on this adjunct teaching circuit. Anytime a teacher would need a break, I was in substitute teaching at the college level. And, uh, and I started a Facebook page, nothing to lose, no money. I said, I'm selling beehives. And I'll volunteer my time to manage them in exchange for research funding. You keep all the honey, and we collect the data. Anybody want some bees? And for the first few months, it was my mother hitting like, <laughs> like, like, go Noah, that's my boy. And I was like, mom, like that, that was a really hard conversation to have. Thank you so much for your support, mom. I need you to pull it back a little bit. I'm trying to start a company and it's not looking legit when you are the number one fan. <laughs> And I can still see the wetness pull up in her eyes. You're like, you want me to stop? And I was like, nope, you know what? Keep going, mom, keep going. And today she is still our number one fan. And we actually had a marketing consultant come in a couple years ago to look at our social media. And she put a slide up and circled, who's this woman, Lynn? You guys really ignore her. And so you're not, you need to respond to the comments. And everybody's like, that's Noah's mom. I love her, and she's great. So this business idea started, again, as something new. I didn't want to compete with honey companies. I didn't want to compete with any existing business, but I wanted to start something new that was connected to science and research. And so this idea of honeybees, it was really interesting from a research perspective, because for any of you who work in health, when you study public health, you really want to look at the individual human and person to understand what they're going through, and everybody's different, but within the context of a community. And so for honeybees, I was studying one bee at a time. I was at the time figuring out how to vaccinate bees, and I was doing surgery one bee at a time with implants and just figuring all these different ways to make bees healthier. And it was really exhausting, and I was thinking, I'm getting nowhere, and uh, I, I'm unhappy. But I started to scale out. And just like with individuals here in Dubuque, you can think about a person, you can think about a family, you can think about a neighborhood or a community, or even as a state, there's different levels of organizations and societies. And honeybees allow us to understand that. There's a theory called superorganism theory, where it's not one individual as the individual, but it's the collective group. So in a way, one could look at our whole room here as one organism. We each play a different role, a different function. So like worker bees are the blood cells, and they're circulating. And the queen bee is the ovaries. She does the reproductive function. And there are teenager bees that hang out at the front on the stoop, and they kind of guard it out. They only let their sisters in, unless somebody has food. They'll be like, OK, you can come in. You know, so they're like the skin of the organism. And when a beehive has a baby, that's a swarm. And a swarm of bees, raise your hand if you've ever seen a swarm. It's like a basketball shape and size cloud of bees flying across your yard. It's kind of startling. It's actually very, very safe because that's when a beehive has a baby. That's when a super organism has, I don't really call it a super baby, but they should. <laughs> and that super organism's baby, that swarm, leaves the mother hive without a place to go. It's like if any of you have had a friend who's you know, moved to somewhere really far away without a job or a home, and you're like, wow, that's well, good for you. <laughs> Where are you going to go? That's what a swarm does, and that's why they'll land on a tree branch or somewhere for about two to three days on average, because they're figuring it out, and they're going to scout out places to live. So they'll always move on on their own, and they're very, very safe to approach, despite them looking quite startling. So that ability to look at the superorganism theory of bees allowed us to do much more research at scale. Instead of one bee at a time, we would look at one beehive at a time. And by empowering beekeepers to come together to create jobs for ourselves, we formed a network of beehives. And now we're in 22 cities where we look at the map and we work with the federal government and NASA to give indications of where bees aren't just dying, but to where they're thriving. And we look at these areas that we call blue zones, 
Now, blue zones is a term from human health, areas where there are many octogenarians. So parts of Japan, people live very long. Parts of the Mediterranean, it's often associated with diet. You know, things to look into there for longevity. So we took a page from human health now and applied it back to bees. And working with the government, we can look on the map of the United States to say, well, where are bees thriving and why? Not just where are they dying and why, because that got very depressing after a while. And this is something that I'm really excited to share back with you today. We've taken this approach for 12 years now, and this is an image of me back in the day, where year one, I thought, if we can just sell 20 beehives, then we're in business. Then we'll have enough research data to really start to compare what's happening uh, over maps and to understand it. And uh, that first year, we sold seven beehives. That was in 2010. So, so I kept bartending, kept teaching, you know, kept hustling, as we've all experienced in life. Year two, I sold 12 beehives. Okay, on our way, you know, it's an annual recurring revenue model. So it's similar to a garden service or a pool service. These are home gardens and business rooftops that hire a beekeeper. It's kind of like Uber for beekeepers, or if there's an, herb, or an Uber for farmers, where it's like, yeah, farm my land. It's not really like that, it's not as random, um, but it's a way to empower people with technology. That third year, though, we sold 65 beehives, and that was this exponential growth where I thought, uh-oh, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> I never took a business class in college. I was just studying bees. But by being open and honest, especially with our first clients, I was in Boston. I took a city bus to the first client who wrote, and he said, I, I work for Google. I grew up in Canada where we had bees everywhere, and I don't know how to do it, and I don't have the time to do it, but I want bees in my garden, and I want my own honey. I said, that's great. You need to know I've never done this before. <laughs> I have never built a beehive. I have never started a beehive. I've managed my school beehives. So I was just honest about it. And when I give talks to kids and to schools, I love to talk about entrepreneurship and empowerment because everybody, well, I was picked on. Maybe, let's see, can I see a raise of hands? Who was picked on as a kid? Is it most people? Whenever you're picked on, that means you stand out. For whatever reason, you know, good, bad, ugly, you know, if you're standing out from the crowd, people are gonna say, oh, look at you, you know, and then for whatever reason. Now, that's what kids have to deal with, but when they grow up, when you stand out, that makes you know something a little bit more than others. Whatever it is, Pokemon, Barbie, you know, insert whatever kids are doing these days. And somebody's gonna ask you about it because you know something about that. And if you charge them a dollar for the answer, you're in business, you're a consultant you know, on whatever you know too much about. And if you start a Facebook page, you know, and ask me about Pokemon, ask, ask Noah, the Pokemon expert, you know, charging a dollar, I mean, that, that's a pretty good profit margin too. So that's a way to empower through entrepreneurship, through technology, in a way that's free, that can make a difference. You're sharing your knowledge with the community. It just takes a shift in perspective, and that's the model that I did here too. We've never looked back. We have visited over 85,000 beehives to date across the country. And uh, for those of you who haven't experienced the wonderful world of beekeeping, it's been really amazing. It's something that allows artists to put corporate logos on beehives. You can work with corporate branding. We've done photo shoots with CEOs and executives to say, look how sustainable we are. Or even homeowners and families to say, hey, I'm a beekeeper. But they don't really have to say, well, they didn't really do it. You know, we can put family names on the honey. And, um, and to date, we have really made a lot of impact with what we've been doing with the standardized model of beekeeping. Now, we've worked with scientists as well as marketers and sales professionals to understand how companies benefit from this. Fairmont Hotels started an international beekeeping program in 2008, you know, before we were doing this, where they require their, bee, their properties to have bees and that honey goes into the, um, the kitchen, into the bar, um, and that's something that really is picking up a lot of steam here. Uh, when citizen scientists get involved, we're able then to add an impact on top of the sales and marketing benefits, like for um, selling events, like for um, weddings, when there is a special jar of honey where it's never expiring. Honey's the only food that doesn't spoil. You can say, it may our love last longer than time. With that, it funds our research, so we're able to dig deeper and to understand where bees are thriving. And one of the approaches that we've done is to get data from the DNA of plants within honey. 
So we see areas like cities where bees are thriving and areas in the countryside where bees are often dying off. And we want to ask big questions from the data that we're getting from companies and families that are benefiting from the honey and the joys of pollination. This is one of my favorite photos when we're understanding how our decisions impact land use. This is the island of Hispaniola. So there's Haiti on the left and the Dominican Republic on the right. And you can see by political decisions or just how we think about our land use, when we're tearing down trees on one side of an island, we have a natural experiment here. And you can understand the relationship between environmental sustainability and economic sustainability. Because when I think about sustainability, I think about them going hand in hand and how by shifting our perspective and including data, we can make advances on both at the same time. So plant biodiversity is something that we can now measure with these data yielding beehives. We think about disaster recovery. Some of our research and beehives have been in areas impacted by wildfires in California. We're looking at samples of honey before and after to understand what plants were lost and what plants bounced back first. Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico was very similar, where if you remember those images, the leaves were blown off the plants, even the derecho here. When we're thinking about the impacts of storm systems and we look at our plants and the biodiversity, we think, oh my gosh, what has happened? It's very difficult to answer that without data. What was here? What bounced back first? Are they native? Are they invasive? How do we come together as a community and make some decisions for if we want to plant more of the plants that bounced back first, and the natives, can we improve our resiliency against climate change and natural disasters? When we're thinking about coastal erosion or any of the river wetlands around Iowa, it's been really interesting to talk to the G7 team here, thinking about restoring habitats in a way that can both feed pollinators as well as have plants with deep roots, so they're preventing erosion too. We can do these at the same time. In terms of the other species of bees, these cryptic ones, one of the things that we're advancing for our research is cutting flowers, just maybe one at a time, and then using this advanced method, again, forensics, looking at DNA, but now of animals, to see what, what are the other species here? For any of you who have a garden, don't you want to know the biodiversity of what it is impacting? We can now, in a lab, look at all the animal DNA to get a list of the bees and the butterflies and everything that's been visiting, even if we don't see it. And that informs us of best practices. This gives us a measure of biodiversity in Dubuque that we then can take a page from the other citizen science approaches, um, like from the Great Sunflower Project, to take a measure over time to finally understand how the decisions we're making of these practices can have positive benefits on biodiversity. You know, thinking that everything has a biological role, people often ask, well, why do we need wasps? What do wasps do? And yesterday, even, we had a conversation about termites. Why do we want that, you know? And everything does a role. Termites are breaking down wood. They help with nutrient cycling. And wasps, because they're predators, they're going to help to eat up some, ben uh, some garden um, uh, pests. So um, even in some areas that have agricultural pests, by adding wasps, that's another way to eat up some weevils and some larvae and some grubs. So everything plays a role here, and everything relates in terms of science, but we need more funding and we need more bandwidth for people who are going to study these other species that we know very little about. Now, to give you more of an example, we're going to dig deep, and I'm going to do a reveal of new data for Dubuque that we never knew before. And this is one thing that I love to do, because not only is it fun to give talks here, but this talk advances our research with the government. This is our first year of having a federal government contract that's called Pollinator Analysis, where we put beehives in 10 of the 11 regions with the General Services Administration to get information about plant biodiversity as it relates to pollinator health. We are studying what's called the habitat hypothesis. So while we know that bees are dying off from diseases and pesticides and land use decisions, what seems to be most associated with what's saving bees is diverse habitat and planting certain things that are very good for their nutrition. So to test this hypothesis, to say, well, what's saving bees instead of what's killing them? It's a slight shift in perspective here. We wanted to dig deeper into the science of honey. And everybody has this, and even if any of you have old samples of honey, we can look deeper into what's called the genome. If any of you have done Ancestry DNA or 23andMe, you know, you spit in a tube and it's like, you're German. <laughs> With honey, we do that, but it's like, you're from rosemary. 
And so it's a way to apply what we already are familiar with, but with improving and measuring biodiversity in a way that improves our experience of tasting our communities. So I want to take a moment and do a reveal for what we did with Dubuque Honey. And we were able to partner up with a local beekeeper and to get a sample and then to look at all the plant DNA forensics and to get a measure of Dubuque's plant diversity. So here we start on the left with some honey. We're digging deeper. We're taking a microscopic view into understanding what that was. And so here's an example. This is not the result for Dubuque Honey, but we partnered with National Geographic to publish this in 2018 of the results of honey DNA, as we call it, across eight or so communities in the United States. This gives information about what you're tasting based on the plant DNA. We still call all honey, honey. And honey's just flower juice, honey. <laughs> So it's really fun to be able to incorporate science into improving our experience. This helps bartenders or mixologists, as the fancy ones want to say, and chefs so they can make a dandelion hun um, honey uh, vinaigrette dressing to be paired with their dandelion salad. I mean, we're seeing this happen all over the country. This particular honey was mostly asparagus. Okay, they have some maples, you know, begonias, roses for the city of Portland, Oregon. Gina spent a lot of time there. We worked with them and the government locally to test their honey DNA, and they are known as the City of Roses, which I actually didn't know, but I saw the honey DNA result, and it was roses. So I was able to report back, hey, City of Roses, your honey is roses. And so they're able to then do as a marketing campaign, come and taste what Portland tastes like. It's been really fun to do. So here's the grand reveal for what Dubuque Honey is. And I know this is too wordy, so this is going to be on the Whova app if it is not up posted yet. We didn't want to do it. It's up now, OK? So what you'll find in the Hova app is a three-page report. The first one's a bit of an explanation. Um, the second page is the Dubuque results. And the third one is uh, actually just from um, Chicago as the local, uh, the closest big city that we've already studied. And so we're updating these results um, all the time with honey samples that come in through our Honey DNA Citizen Science Research Project. People from around the world send in samples of honey. 58.84% of Dubuque honey was from clover. Now let me tell you something. Clover might not be the most exciting or surprising result for honey. I'll tell you that. But look, anybody here, you know clover. You know Dubuque, even if you're not from here. You can taste what Dubuque tastes like. And it's not only clover. It's not just, oh, 100% clover, honey. There's a lot more that's adding flavor to help us understand and experience what Dubuque tastes like. There are legumes. There's another type of clover called white sweet clover. 5.4% daisy, 4.23% grasses. And then we look at the scientific name, and we're able to then work with the community, and we share these results back with you, to then you have conversations. Why don't you select out the native ones? Or why don't you work with local garden centers to figure out what you might want to promote for things that are appropriate for your community that help improve bee health? And by doing so, you might be able to cause an improvement in bee health rather than just understand what's correlated with bee health by saying, oh, we've got 5,000 different species here, but you and your own actions by planting specific seeds that as a community, you might say, oh, these are important for our culture. And um, my grandma had a recipe with these legumes, 1.09% um, buckwheat you know, or willow. You talk about that and figure what you might want to promote. There is a wonderful tree program here that we've been talking a lot about this morning. When you as a community decide what trees to plant, if you have to replace a tree, maybe there's a pollinator tree. We're actually seeing 3.05% from pine trees that's making it back into honey. And that's so strange to see because pine is a conifer. It doesn't have flowers. So where might that come from? Well, you can understand with a concept called honeydew, there's some scale insects that are drinking the sap from pine and then excreting this honeydew that bees could then pick up. And the texture of pine honey tends to be very smooth. So it's not just the taste, it's not just the science, it's the flavor, it's the experience that's uniquely Dubuque honey.
and it all warrants further conversation. And by having these conversations here, you're then showing other communities how to have them as well. And this is a snapshot of the National Geographic spread that we did that we can also share with anybody that just showed other communities and what it looks like from San Francisco on the left that was also pine but eucalyptus. That community did not like this result. San Francisco said, you cannot be going out there telling people to promote eucalyptus. That is not native. Eucalyptus is prone to fire. Eucalyptus limbs drop at will onto people's cars. And this is the importance of community. This is not what I'm saying, go do this. This is me saying, here's what science found. What do y'all want to do with this? Also, underneath both of those in San Francisco, it's rosemary. I mean, how cool is that to have a kitchen garden that's good for your family and for the bees when you see it bloom? Portland, Oregon, I mentioned roses in the middle, also chestnut trees and begonias, and Seattle on the right, cypress, linden, and white sweet clover that we also saw here in Dubuque. So to summarize this up a little bit here, the Great Agree movement is something that relates very deeply to my childhood. I was born in New York City in Manhattan. I grew up playing on rooftops with my cousin whose uh, childhood playground for his school was up on rooftops. And we would think, what's happening on those other rooftops? Like, do those kids have better swing sets? And how do we get on those? Only to grow up and realize, no, they don't have anything on those roofs. And in fact, those rooftops are 40 degrees hotter than nearby green rooftops. So this is part of the gray to green movement. It did start in New York City from a man named Adam Purple, who did a concept called guerrilla gardening. And this is uh, not gorilla the animal, but this is really thinking about how you can change your perspective as citizens, as policy um, uh, deciders to allow gardens and things to be planted in abandoned property. In the 1960s, Lower East Side of Manhattan, he transformed that abandoned area one brick at a time because he saw kids playing in very dangerous areas where buildings were falling down into beautiful gardens. And then at about 10 to 15 years later, the city bulldozed them because that was the policy. It wasn't okay to allow for this type of behavior. When you didn't own the land, you couldn't make your neighborhood greener. So this is how we come together and we can envision things like bus stops. Why don't you put a pollinator habitat up there? It can reduce water runoff. We can think about other policies or promotions. No mow May, don't mow your lawn for the month of May. I know it can be hard for some people, but you save the money. You promote pollinator health with meadows and you test it out just for a month. November's coming up, there's a term called leaf them be. So you can have some fun promotions that build community and you see what's going on there. Um, pollinator pathways are when you link all of these together. And I'm going to go out here to um, other awards and recognition. Dubuque knows all about this. Pollinator pathways are something to really think about connecting communities where even the smallest green space like a single flower can be part of a flyway. We're seeing this a lot with monarch butterflies that are migratory. We can learn a little bit more about that. And some images from our community beekeeping, whether it's in urban areas um, or in rural areas. And my really closing thought is I want for each of you to consider becoming what we call a pollinator champion. And this helps to identify you within your group. Maybe this is at work, maybe this is in your government or in your community and say, you know, I'm gonna be a pollinator champion. And this really allows people to say, I'm gonna be a point person to promote the following things. This is my closing slide. Anytime there's an opportunity to replace plantings, replace something that's already there, just be mindful about what we know our community benefits the most from, from people, from, for pollinators, and also for profits, because now honey sellers in Dubuque might be able to say, oh, this honey is 58% you know, clover. By identifying what it is, maybe they can charge 50% more of a premium because it's a special honey. And we see this from Manuka honey in New Zealand that is so infinity O's expensive. <laughs> it's like $33 a pound because they know what type of honey it is, just like the champagne of champagnes from France. There are marketing benefits that can bring money into the community by adding value through science. When you're designing new buildings, think about what you can do for lead credits, US Green Building Council. We'll talk a lot more about this stuff anytime you want. I'm gonna be here for the rest of the day. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity and I hope you do become pollinator champions. So thanks again. Take questions. Yes, over here. So if you planted a different type of flower near your bees, would they go to the nearest thing or would they, they travel or would they have specific plants they like? 
Really fun question. So to repeat the question, if you plant specific flowers, will you then expect bees to come? And do they go to certain flower species that they like? And this is where we can bring native bees back into the conversation. Now, research has shown for honeybees, they tend to not pollinate very close to the beehive. And the early days of the Best Bees Company, our clients actually would complain to say, I'm not seeing bees on my property. I got a garden, we got bees here, where are they going? And I think, gee whiz, I really wish I could tell the bees where to go, but I can't, <laughs> you know, I wish I could, might not work here, I don't know if this company's a good idea. Um, but we learned that bee, honeybees will typically forage about 40 to 50 feet beyond where their hive is, and that works very well with native bee species. Sometimes you've heard of bee hotels or nesting sites for these other bees to just kind of move on in, kind of like a birdhouse. That radius is better for native bees. Sometimes they're called blue orchard bees or mason bees. And that's why it's really fun to do a bee safari. If you plant things, things will come, but they might not be honeybees. Again, honeybees are just an indicator species to inform us with assumptions about how other species are doing, but you're very likely to see other species of bees benefit from this work. Bees tell us what to, honeybees tell us what to plant, we go do it, and then we've got to see what happens. And I think amazing things will for biodiversity. Yeah. to have more native plants. Yeah. So how do we have more landscapers and nurseries to have more native plants? Well, get out your pollinator champion pin, which we haven't invented yet, but I will say, Mayor, that's a nice pin. So with Sustainable Dubuque, maybe we can do it pollinator champion one, but I think by identifying yourself as such, you'll be looking like, okay, well, who are you? What do you want to talk about? But it's, you know, it's a disarming conversation where you can say, look, we have information from science that is telling us what the plants are in our community. And then you can also say, you know, science aside, there's a great perspective that we learn from Native Americans. Uh, there's a great book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin, Robin Wall Kimmerer that compares this modern science approach to local knowledge. And that's really important too. And so you don't have to have a scientific report to work with landscapers and garden centers to say, I know this plant is native. And I know that this attracts butterflies and hummingbirds and bees. And I want to work together to help promote this because this can bring money to your business by doing the right thing. Oftentimes the consumers just don't know. That's not their fault. But people do care about this. Bees are a bipartisan issue. They truly, truly are. Everybody cares about this, especially when it makes their property more beautiful. And it, you're guiding their dollars that are going to be spent anyway in a plant, but just saying, well, why don't you buy this instead of that? In a way that you work together with the economy so they can maybe even be known. Like, hey, that's a great native plant nursery in Iowa. You start to get a reputation for that. So you work together in an informative way where we all can do better together. We can follow up more, too. Other questions? Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> well, um, so a lot of, uh, I won't yell now, <laughs> a lot of uh, native plants um, are cultivated into different mm. types for color, like the coneflower, for example. Can you explain if bees can see the difference mm. and if they really prefer the native? So this question really goes back to citizen science. So for any of you, regardless of age, ability, background, any kids, if you want to plant different cultivars in a meadow together, and then like the Great Sunflower Project taught us, just take notes, see which ones they're going to. I think that's the best way to have a local approach to decide as a community what's best for here. We do know when there's different varietals of cultivars for native plants that sometimes these double blooms or things that um, are very fancy make it a little harder for pollinators to reach the, the pollen and to reach the nectar. So simple uh, blooms that open widely tend to be best for pollinators rather than complex ones. Um, but it really, I think, is the best approach to interact with science in a way that's approachable and to start recording some data just with a pen and paper and make those simple observations together, especially with kids. They just notice this stuff. And instead of teaching them all the time, it's a great way to learn from them. When they say, hey, did you see that? Like, well, no, I didn't see that, actually. You know? And it feels better to the soul. Questions from over here? Yeah. What 
Mm, what methods are we using to deal with, I love these words, spastic springs and recurrence of winter. So for us, because we're doing this at scale across 22 communities now, it's really allowed us to do more by linking our communities together in a network, and especially with support from the federal government to figure out how different sites, let's say from EPA offices nationwide or any office parks, they can really help. When we were focused only in Boston, our field season was so limited. And any time we would make a mistake, we would say, oh, well, better luck next year. And so I've been lucky enough to relocate now to California, where if I make a mistake with our research, I can just start again tomorrow. I mean, how many times in life do we wish we could have a do-over? You know, and especially when winter comes, it's an amazing time to pause and rest and read and learn. Sometimes we just want to get back outside. And so being able to say, okay, well, this research isn't going to work anymore in Boston, but we've got a site in Texas or Los Angeles. That's how we've been able to do it. So anything that happens here in Dubuque with your own community, if you need a do-over and you got to wait a period, try to go on the road a little bit. And I know with the mayor, we've been talking about a conference of mayor, mayors, and they come together and they have conversations. So that's where collaborations are key. Um, we've been able to do some crazy research with very controlled environments that don't have winter, like outer space. With MIT, we did send bees into space on a rocket ship to understand their health. This was the third time in human history that bees have gone into space, and the research has consistently shown, now this is really crazy, bees do better in space. <laughs> they make their honeycomb in different directions. They don't just build down. If any of you can picture a beehive where you lift up the slat, they are building in all different directions. So space bees have amazing architecture and it's very controlled, they don't have winter. So winter can be a challenge, winter is also a blessing. I grew up in Connecticut, I love winter, and it's something that gives us pause, but also has its challenges too. But coming together as a network is the way. I'm out of time, so thank you again. Well, thank you very much, Noah. That was that was fascinating and just and, and just very intriguing. So, thank you so much for being with us today, and thank you all for being here to to listen to this.